afternoon and welcome to our Bogart Wealth webinar series. My name is Nell Kordick and I am a financial advisor with Bogart Wealth. Today we will be talking about the basics of estate planning. We'll look at several general estate planning concepts and strategies. While there's no such thing as one size fits all estate plan, this overview may assist you in thinking about your own estate planning needs and may help guide your understanding of the purpose of the various estate documents. I do want to give full disclosure, I am not an estate planning attorney, um, and we do recommend that you meet with an estate attorney as you are creating and or revising your documents. So today we'll be, we'll be doing the webinar. I do have the question and answer box open. So if you do have questions that you would like to ask along the way, I'll try to keep that monitored. Um, in addition, I have received a few questions in advance via email, and I will try to um, answer those as well during the presentation. So um, with that, we will go ahead and get started. So regarding first, just to introduce Bogart Wealth to you, for those of you who might be new to our firm, our mission is to help clients achieve financial peace of mind by preserving and maximizing intergenerational wealth. A little background on us, we are a firm that has over 2.6 billion of assets under management, and we work with over 1,250 households. We are a registered investment advisor firm, which means we are an independent fiduciary advisor working in our client's best interest. We custody our assets at Charles Schwab for your protection, and we are a fee-only wealth management firm. Bogart Wealth has financial advisors located in both McLean and Houston, and we work with clients in numerous states across the country. We have a full operations team and financial planning team, both in our Virginia and Texas offices. We also manage our investments in-house, and we work with a local CPA firm in Texas to help our clients with tax preparation needs. We have three locations, our headquarters in McLean, Virginia, and two offices in Houston, one in Gessner, and one in the Woodlands. So what is an estate plan? Simply put, it is a map of how you want your personal and financial affairs to be handled in case of incapacity or death, and the subsequent implementation of the strategies that will fulfill those objectives. If you have not done any estate planning documents, the first step is to sit down and determine who you want your assets to be left to when you pass away, and when do you want those assets to go to those beneficiaries. Once you have decided those two key concepts, then an attorney can help you formulate which are the best documents to use in order to make your wishes be, be in place. Who needs an estate plan? Chances are you do. You may think that estate planning is just for the ultra wealthy, but in fact, it is not. Without an estate plan, you cannot control what happens to your property if you die or become incapacitated. Generally, people create estate plans because they want that control. They also want to make sure that their wishes are clear in order to avoid any family disputes. In addition, they care about preserving their property for their loved ones and want to make sure that their loved ones are properly prepared for. So an estate plan is also some other key things to think about is that if one of your, if a spouse or significant other is not comfortable with handling financial matters, if you have an estate that will be impacted by transfer taxes, for example, in 2024, on the federal level, that generally means estates that are over 13610000 We'll go into more detail about that later. Also be aware that this amount may be lower on the state level. States impose their own transfer taxes and each state has a different exemption amount. Some states 
are aligned with the federal exemption and some states are unique, unique to themselves. Estate planning is also particularly important if you have minor children and if you have property in more than one state, it's very important. If you have privacy concerns and if you have distinct needs, for example, you may own a business and need to be planning for the success succession of that business. These are the estate planning concepts that we will be reviewing today. We'll talk about first planning for incapacity. We'll talk about which involves healthcare issues and property management issues. Then we'll be talking about planning for death, focusing on understanding the role of wills and probate, understanding tax basics, lifetime giving, trust, and then the role that life insurance will play in your estate plan. So first talking about incapacity. Incapacity describes a condition in which you are legally unable to make your own decisions. We're talking about planning for incapacity first because incapacity can happen to anyone at any time. Think for a moment what might happen if, for example, you were to become the victim of an accident that puts you in a coma for several months. How would your doctor know what medical treatments you would want or not want if you cannot speak for yourself? How would your personal business be transacted if no one is authorized to sign documents for you? What would happen if, if this were to happen? Well, what the process would be that someone would have to go to court and get legal permission to do things for you. And that person who is called a guardian and is usually a close family friend or a family member, such as a spouse or a child, would have to go back to court every time different permissions are necessary. As you can imagine, this might be quite burdensome to the guardian. Further, without any prepared instructions from you, your guardian might make decisions that would be different from what you would decide or wish for. So let's talk first about healthcare decisions and healthcare directives. There are, you can leave instructions about your medical care you would want if conditions were such that you couldn't express your own wishes. There are three different types of documents that we will discuss. First is a living will. Second is a durable power of attorney for health care. And third is a DNR or do not resuscitate order. A living will is a document that lists the types of medical treatments you would want or not want under particular circumstances. For example, your living will might state that you would not want life support if you fall into a persistent vegetative state. With a living will, you'll have to think about all the possible scenarios where you would want a specific action to be taken and then put your wishes in writing so that the reader will clearly understand your wishes. A durable power of attorney for health care or a health care proxy lets one or more family members or other trusted individuals, they are typically called agents, they would make medical care decisions for you. Unlike a living will, with this type of health care directive, you don't have to envision special circumstances. You simply grant authority to your agent or agents to make decisions for you. And then third, a do not resuscitate order is used for a different purpose. Let's say that you're in the hospital lingering or suffering with a terminal illness, and you do not want the hospital staff to take life-saving measures if you suddenly go into cardiac or respiratory arrest. To make sure your wishes are carried out, you may be able to get your doctor to issue a DNR. A DNR is a legal form signed by both you and your doctor that's posted by your bed to give staff members the permission they need to carry out your wishes. 
Be careful when using a DNR. Some states require their own DNR form, and some states require one DNR form if you're in the hospital and a different DNR form if you're in a nursing home. Be aware that some states don't recognize some of these healthcare directives. So depending on your state, you might need one of these, two of them, or all three. Now let's take a look at some property management tools. Since we've talked about the healthcare decisions, now let's talk about if you're incapacitated, who makes decisions regarding your assets. There are three ways you can plan to have your financial affairs taken care of in the event that you become incapacitated. You can arrange to own property jointly. You can appoint an agent using a durable power of attorney, or you can create and put property in a living trust and name someone to take over the management of the trust if something happens to you. So first let's talk about joint ownership. Granting joint ownership of your property to another person allows that person to have the same access to the property as you do. If you become incapacitated, your joint owner simply acts. For example, if you and your spouse have a joint checking account, each of you can make deposits and each of you can make withdrawals and each of you can write checks. So if you were to go into a coma, your spouse would be able to make the mortgage payments on time, for example. A durable power of attorney lets you name family members, or a trusted individual to make financial decisions or transact business on your behalf. Basically, a durable power of attorney allows that person to act as if they were you. In addition to joint ownership and a durable power of attorney, using a living trust is another common strategy. We'll talk in more details about trust later, but for now, just know that a living trust can be used in planning for incapacity because someone called a successor trustee can step into your shoes to manage the property in the trust if something should happen to you. Very similar to the healthcare directives, in many cases, all three of these strategies are appropriate depending on the type of asset that we're talking about. So in many cases, you might actually use all three of these strategies. All of us make plans that are based on the possibility that a specific event may occur. Many of us carry more than the minimum required amount of auto insurance, for example, because we recognize the possibility that financial loss could result from an accident. Since it is 100% certain that each of us is going to die at some point, you might want to think that everyone would have an estate plan. Unfortunately, in many cases, there are a lot of people that have not created their estate plan. In a lot of situations, it may be one asset that they don't know who to leave it to that is keeping them from, from creating their basic documents. So do the first steps, create the basic documents. They can always be revised at some point in the future, but at least have some protections in place. So what happens if you do not have any estate plan created? If you own property jointly, the property then passes automatically to the joint owner upon your death. If you have an IRA or a retirement plan, or you own in life insurance or other accounts that have an assigned beneficiary, then the assets will pass to that designated beneficiary when you die. However, if you have property that does not have a beneficiary and does not have a joint owner, and you have not prepared your estate documents, they would pass according to the state intestacy laws. These laws govern the disposition of property 
when someone dies without a will and and you have to abide by what the state laws would say for that particular part of your estate. Let's say you die leaving $5,000 in a savings account. Who does the money go to? Without instructions from you, the money would go to the person or people that your state's intestacy laws say it should go to. These laws vary from state to state, but you, you usually see a typical pattern that some percent would go to the spouse, usually 50%, and then some percent would go to be equally divided to the children, usually the other 50%. Remember, it may be different in any particular state. The biggest issue with intestacy is the fact that your actual wishes are irrelevant. Let's assume that you live in a state that shows 50% going to the spouse and 50% going to the children, but your wish is that all of your property goes to your spouse. There would be no choice, but it would have to be divided based upon the state laws. There are many potential problems with allowing your, your property to pass by intestacy. For example, the distribution pattern imposed by your state's intestacy laws could result in disputes among your heirs. It could create higher overall taxes due. It can be particularly problematic for unmarried couples as generally the law does not include a non-spouse um, or um, non-blood related children. There's a very simple way to avoid intestacy, and that is to create your will, your and or a trust. How many people here have a will? I hope that it's 100%. A will is probably the most vital piece of anyone's estate plan. Everyone needs at least the basic will. A will is a legal document in which you direct your property, it, you direct how your property will be dispersed when you die. It also allows you to name an executor who will carry out the wishes stated in your will. In addition, you will, it will let you name a guardian for your minor children. And furthermore, your will can create what's called a testamentary trust in your will to move assets into a trust when you pass away. You can use your will to accomplish other estate planning goals as well, such as tax planning. To be valid, your will must be in writing and signed by you. Your signature must also be witnessed, although the number of witnesses varies from state to state. And these requirements are important because if you aren't, if you aren't careful, um, then your will could be invalid. And so be careful of creating a do-it-yourself type of a will. Um, you want to, in fact, um, utilize an estate planning attorney to make sure that things are in, com in compliance with your particular state. Now, there is one big consideration to having a will for some people, and that's the, the fact that wills generally have to go through a process known as probate. So when we are looking at the process of probate, what that is, is first of all, the rules here again vary from state to state. But in some states, smaller estates are exempt from probate, and they qualify for an expedited process. But if it's if it is not um, qualified for the expedited process, and by the way, that threshold is very low, first probate starts with someone filing the will with the probate court, which will then oversee the estate settlement process. Usually the person named as the executor in the will does this. Once the will is filed with the court and validated, the executor can go about the business of settling the estate. This means collecting monies owed to the person who died, such as wages, paying any outstanding bills, filing final income tax, 
and estate tax returns if necessary, and then distributing the remaining property to the rightful heirs stated in the will. Usually, everything goes smoothly in the probate process, which typically lasts anywhere from a few months to a year, depending on the size of the estate, as long as the executor does what needs to be done in a timely fashion and there are no family squabbles. Nevertheless, some people may want to avoid this process. So typically, any assets that are not jointly held and do not have a beneficiary are the assets that would have to go through probate. Before we look at the reasons why you might want to avoid probate, let's review the positive aspects of probate. For most estates, there's usually reason to avoid probate. There's usually little reason to avoid probate. The actual time and cost involved are usually modest if it is a straightforth estate, and it doesn't make sense to plan around it. And there are actually a couple of benefits from probate. Because the court supervises the process, you have some assurances that your wishes will be abided by, and if a family squabble should arise, then the court can help to settle the matter. Further, probate offers some protection against creditors. As part of the probate process, creditors are notified to make their claims against the estate in a timely manner. If they do not, it becomes much more difficult for them to make their claims later. But for some complex estates, probate can be very burdensome, taking up to two or three years to complete. This could tie up property that your family may need immediately and increase the costs that can arise, such as executor fees, attorney fees, and insurance costs. And if you have real estate in more than one state, for example, if you own a summer home in Maine and a winter home in Florida, your executor will have to file in each state where the property is located and this can be referred to what is called ancillary probate. Additionally, wills and other documents submitted for probate become part of public record, which may be undesirable for you or your family members if they have privacy concerns. Um, there are state rules that apply, to, uh, this is a comment, there are state rules that apply to estate plans and end of life documents. So if you have documents in place and move to another state, you should have your, your documents reviewed. Thank you very much. That is an excellent point, um, both for wills, trust, all of your estate documents, because the, the laws are different from state to state. Definitely have um, documents reviewed when you change your state of residency. Can you avoid probate? If any of these issues are a concern to you, an estate plan can be designed to limit the assets that pass through probate or to avoid probate altogether. The major ways that property is passed outside of probate are by owning property jointly with rights of survivorship, ensuring that beneficiary designation forms are completed for those type of assets that allow them, such as IRAs, retirement plans, life insurance, um, and any other account that would allow a payable upon death or transfer upon death designation. In addition, there are many states that will also allow um, the a transfer of death to be put actually onto real estate as well. Um, by putting property into a trust and by making lifetime gifts. So those are several of the ways to avoid probates. Um, we did have a question that came through, what liabilities do not pass through probate? Um, I think that most liabilities um, would 
pass through probate if they were in your own name. Um, if there is, and, and I'm, I'm saying this very generally, but I would say that um, if there is a liability that is owned by a trust, um, that then that would probably pass through a trust. But otherwise, if the liability is your own name, I would um, think that the probate court would be responsible for overseeing that that were taken care of if that were in the provision of your of your documents. Sometimes there are some provisions with um, credit card debts and things like that that are unsecured. Um, there may be some other other provisions there, but I would say yes, that most debt, if it's in your name, that the probate court would be reviewing. There are three types of federal taxes that may be imposed when property is transferred from one person to another, either during life or at death. Referred to collectively as transfer taxes, these taxes are the gift tax, the estate tax, and the generation skipping transfer tax. We're going to discuss transfer taxes on the federal level only, but be aware that individual states may also impose their own transfer taxes and they generally do affect smaller estates as well. It's important for you to get more information on the transfer taxes imposed by your particular state. If you, the donor, transfer property to another person, the donor during life, the transfer may be subject to gift tax. The reason that there's a gift tax is to prevent individuals from avoiding the estate tax by giving all of their property away before they die. The gift tax does not apply to every lifetime gift. For example, in 2024, you can give up to $18,000 to as many individuals as you want gift tax free under the annual gift tax exclusion. By the way, that $18,000 figure is for 2024, but the annual gift tax, gift tax exclusion is indexed for inflation, so it may change in future years. In addition, each individual has a lifetime exclusion from all transfers, that's gifts and your estate combined, and that amount is $13,610,000 in 2024. That's the largest exemption that has ever been allowed in the history of the federal gift and estate tax. When property is transferred at death, it is generally subject to estate tax. This is true whether or not the property goes through probate. For example, even though funds in an IRA pass by virtue of a beneficiary designation, the funds are still potentially subject to estate tax. As with the gift tax, there are exceptions to the estate tax. For example, property that you leave to your spouse will generally not be subject to estate tax because there's a full deduction allowed for marital transfers. A similar deduction is available for, for property left to a charity. In addition, as discussed on the previous slide, each individual has a lifetime exclusion from gifts and estate tax combined. That amount is $13,610,000 in 2024. To be clear, there is one $13,610,000 exclusion that covers both gifts and estates. So any portion of the exclusion you use for gifts while you are still living will not be available for your, for your estate. There's a new feature of the lifetime exclusion that is potentially very important to married couples. The exclusion is portability. portability. That means that any portion of the exclusion that is not used by a deceased spouse can be transferred to the surviving spouse. 
In prior years, that was not the case. So married couples with larger estates had to do what is referred to as bypass planning, typically using a trust. But starting in 2011 and later years, such planning has not been necessary for transfer tax purposes, although there are still some other good reasons that you may want to use a bypass trust. But that is more than we really are going to go into today. Suffice it to say that together, a married couple can pass $27,200,000 tax-free as long as the estate of the deceased spouse makes the proper election on the estate tax return and claims the portability. Um, and I did have a question. For clarity, the annual exclusion of $18,000 per person does or does not get included in the calculation of the $13.6 million. It does not. So that's kind of a freebie that you can gift up to $18,000 per person um, and it does not count as part of your lifetime exemption or exclusion. The third piece of the transfer tax system that we need to mention is the generation skipping transfer tax, the GST. In the world of estate planning, someone who is more than one generation below you, for example, a grandchild or a great-grandchild, is referred to as a skip person. If property is transferred either during life or at death to a skip person, then the transfer is subject to generation skipping transfer tax, which is imposed in addition to gift tax or estate tax. The reason there's a generation skipping transfer tax is to prevent individuals from avoiding estate tax on the intermediate or the skipped generation. The government wants to collect their taxes at every generation. Because the generation skipping transfer tax is a separate tax, you get a separate exemption. The exemption for generation skipping transfer tax purposes is also $13,610,000 in 2024. Unlike the gift and estate tax exclusion, the GST tax exemption is not portable. And I think there's another question. Yes, a nephew is considered a skip person. Um, so it's, um, no, 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 excuse me. A nephew is not considered a skip person because it's in the next generation. A great nephew would, because that would be like a, a grandchild. So a nephew would be as if in the same generation as your own children. Some key figures are adjusted each year for inflation. You can see how the exclusion and exemption amounts have changed. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act signed into law in December 2017 doubled the gift and estate exclusion amount and the GST tax exemption to $11,180,000 in 2018. The amounts are $13,610,000 in 2024. After 2025, they are scheduled to revert to pre-2018 levels and will be cut by about one half. If your estate is larger than the exclusion or exemption, you may want to do some additional estate planning to minimize the potential impact of transfer taxes. So this is going to be a very, very big consideration, depending on how Congress may act in 2025, of whether they will extend this law further or whether they will allow them to sunset back to 2017. But it is going to be a very important year in talking about estate planning. Making gifts during one's lifetime is a common estate planning strategy that it can also serve to minimize transfer taxes. In fact, transferring property to your heirs during your lifetime has certain advantages over waiting until you die. For one thing, when you make lifetime gifts, you have the satisfaction of seeing the recipients enjoy your gifts. For many people though, gifting is used to minimize transfer taxes. 
As I mentioned earlier, one way to do this is take advantage of the annual gift tax exclusion, which lets you give up to $18,000 to as many individuals as you want, gift tax-free in 2024. And there are several other gift tax exclusions and deductions that you might want to consider as well. When, In addition, when you give property that is expected to appreciate in value, you remove the future appreciation from your taxable estate. However, I would, would want to mention that when you gift very highly appreciated asset, you're also gifting your cost basis. So the, um, the recipient would still have the same cost basis um, that, that you would have as far as whenever they would decide to sell that particular asset. There is one trade-off to lifetime gifting, however. Generally, if you give property during your life, your basis in the property for federal income tax purposes is carried over to the person who receives the gift. So if you give your a million dollar home that you purchased for 50,000 to your brother, your $50,000 basis carries over to your brother. If he sells the house immediately, income tax will be due on the resulting gains. In contrast, if you leave property to your heirs at death, they get a stepped up basis in the property equal to the property's fair market value at the time of your death. So if your home that you purchase for $50,000 is worth a million when you die, your heirs get the property with now a new cost basis of a million dollars. And if they sell the house immediately, they pay no federal income tax. Remember that the annual gift tax exclusion lets you give 18,000 to as many individuals as you want gift tax free. If you and your spouse make gifts together, you can double that amount and give 36,000 to as many individuals as you want. If you're contributing to a child or grandchild's Section 529 plan, a type of tax deferred college savings plan, you can give 90,000 or five years worth in 2024 gift tax free to the 529 plan though you will have to report the gift over a period of five years. If you and your spouse contribute together, this amount is 180,000. Certain conditions apply in each case. Be aware that if you should die during the five-year period, a pro rata share of the gift will be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. Also be aware that the $18,000 figure is indexed for inflation so this amount may rise or fall in future years. In addition, there's no gift tax imposed on any amounts paid directly to an institutional's, an educational institution for an individual's tuition. There's also no gift tax imposed on any amounts paid directly to a medical care provider for an individual's medical care including payments for health insurance premiums. So the question came in, what if a child passed away and never received any gifts and their children are now the beneficiaries, regeneration skipping? Um, I would like to um, do some research on that and, and let you know for sure on that. I, I think it is still considered a generation skip but I'm not 100% sure. So I do want to do some research on that if that would be okay. If you aren't inclined to make outright gifts, you might consider using a trust. A trust is a common and versatile estate planning tool. We've already seen that a trust can play a role in planning for a capacity and in avoiding probate. In addition, you may want to use a trust as part of your overall strategy to minimize transfer taxes, to have certain property managed by a professional, and to provide for minor children, elderly parents, or other beneficiaries. And certain trusts can be established to protect your assets from future creditors. Most importantly though, 
trust can provide a means to administer property on an ongoing basis according to your wishes, allowing you to maintain a degree of control after property is placed in the trust, even after your death. A trust is a legal entity where someone who is called the grantor, who is usually you are the grantor, arranges with another person who's called the trustee to hold property for the benefit of a third party who's called the beneficiary. The grantor names the beneficiary and the trustee and establishes the rules the trust must follow in a document known as a trust agreement. When you create a trust, you split the ownership of the trust property. Legal ownership goes to the trustee and beneficial ownership goes to the beneficiary. That means that the trustee is legally responsible for managing the property according to the trust rules and that the beneficiary receives the financial benefits such as income principal and use of an enjoyment from the trust property. A trust that you create while you're alive is referred to as a living or inter vivos trust or a revocable trust. A trust that is created upon your death becomes irrevocable, and if it is created under the terms of your will, it is known as a testamentary trust. If you have the right to change or end the trust anytime you want to, the trust is described as a revocable trust. If the trust cannot be changed or revoked, the trust is described as an irrevocable trust. A revocable trust generally becomes irrevocable when you die, since you are no longer around to change or revoke it. While we won't go into great detail, revocable trusts are commonly used to plan for incapacity and avoid probate. A trust avoids probate because the trust agreement itself determines what happens to the trust property upon your death. Irrevocable trusts, on the other hand, are commonly used for transfer tax planning and creditor pr protection. Before we go into the life insurance, I did want to um, answer a couple of questions that came via email in advance. So there was a question that if you own your house in your name, and um, but you have a mortgage on it, can you still retitle the house in the name of the trust? And the answer is most of the time, yes. There are very few instances where I've ever seen that not be allowed. Um, the estate attorney would prepare the documents and that would be recorded that change the title from your individual name into the trust. And they're basically recorded at the courthouse. So it is officially in the name of the trust. There were also a question around trust provisions for children. And quite honestly, this is one of the of a very, very um, strong reason to have a trust. You can create a lot of detail in terms of the provisions for your children, whether they are minors or whether they are adult or adults. You can put in what they can receive distributions for. You can also put in place um, restrictions on how much they receive and at what points in the future they would receive assets. You can put lots of different restrictions or um, guardrails against the distribution of your estate. And then um, what um, issues come up regarding, um, and this was referring to Texas only, but um, if you own your house free and clear and you want to put the house into the trust, um, how might it conflict with the Texas homestead laws and um, as long as you your trust is compliant um, and it's, it is a qualifying trust and there are certain provisions that make it a qualifying trust, then it will not inhibit the homestead rule. Um, and basically a qualifying trust is that you're still using it as your primary residence. It is a revocable trust, which means you haven't passed away. Um, and there's several other um, components to it. But for the most part, I would say most of the time, your trust would fall into being a qualified trust in, in all likelihood. 
Um, so now we're going to look at life insurance and um, how does that play a part in your estate plan? So for example, if you um, basically have a small or modest estate, life insurance can be used to actually create an estate. In other words, the life insurance proceeds will be the primary financial resource for your surviving family members, at least until they're able to access other financial resources. Life insurance can also be used to provide for liquidity for your estate. That is, the life insurance proceeds will be able to provide the cash that your survivors may need to pay for final expenses, outstanding debts, and taxes. For example, you may have physical assets such as a home, a retirement plan, investments that you do not want to be liquidated but left intact in for a surviving spouse. Life insurance can play many other roles as well, such as cre creating a bequest to a charity, providing funds for children, providing funds for education, etc. You need to be aware, however, that the general rule is that life insurance proceeds will be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. Now recall, in the beginning of this presentation, I made clear that we're not only talking about, we're only talking about taxes on the federal level here, and the situation may be, may be different for state to state. That basically the exemption amount for 2024 is up to the 13 million 610,000. So if your estate is getting close to that amount, you do, and you have life insurance, you need to keep in mind that the life insurance is added to the value of all of your other assets. Although the general rule is that life insurance proceeds are included in your estate for estate tax purposes, an estate plan can be structured to exclude the insurance proceeds from your taxable estate. The key issue is the ownership of the life insurance policy. A common strategy to avoid estate tax on life insurance uses a trust to own the life insurance policy. Such a trust is commonly referred to as an irrevocable life insurance trust or islet. If the islet owns the life insurance policy, the proceeds of the policy will not be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. However, this is only true if the strategy is correctly implemented. Ultimately, you'll need to work with an experienced estate planning attorney if this strategy is of interest and beneficial to you. But let me give you a basic idea how an islet can work. You basically create an irrevocable trust or a, an attorney creates an irrevocable trust. You name someone as the trustee, cannot be yourself, and you name the beneficiaries. The trustee will buy a new life insurance policy on your life and the islet will actually own the policy. You make cash gifts to the islet, the trustee then notifies the beneficiaries that you have made the cash gifts. They have a limited window of time during which they have a technical right to withdraw your cash gift. But if they don't, since withdrawing the gifts would de defeat the purpose of the trust, then the, um, the withdrawal period is complete. The trustee then uses the cash gifts to pay the premiums on the policy to the life insurance company. At your death, the islet receives the proceeds of the life insurance policy. If properly implemented, no estate tax is due on the life insurance proceeds and the funds are distributed according to the terms of the trust. The beneficiaries of the islet receive funds free from estate tax. Like most trusts, Irrevocable life insurance trust are a more advanced estate planning strategy, and I've just attempted to give you a very basic understanding of how they might apply to your situation. If you're interested in learning more, I'd be happy to provide additional information for you.
As we wrap up, take a moment and ask yourself these questions. Do I have a plan in place for incapacity? Do I have a will? If the answer to either question is no, there is no time to waste. You need to address these issues as soon as possible. Ask yourself as well if transfer taxes are an issue for you. Not only are they an issue for you today, but could they be an issue for you in the future? And if the answer, again, is that it is an issue, again, time is of the essence to really be thinking about what are your options for estate planning. And finally, even if you have an estate plan, when was it last reviewed and when was it last updated? Laws will change from time to time. Um, The people that you have in place to be your executor, your successor trustee, even your beneficiaries may change, and therefore you want a document that also um, has, has made the, the proper changes as well, as well. Small steps can enhance your financial life one day at a time. Um, so it's very important to, to be, you know, very to make sure we're doing the proper reviews. And at this point, I do welcome, we would welcome all of you to do a one-on-one session with any of the advisors at Bogart Wealth. We think that it's a very important part of our discussion of understanding through our financial planning process what your estate may be at some point in the future, and therefore understanding what are your options today. Um, The most important thing is that your documents are flexible and that they really are built to evolve with any types of future changes to the law and that um, so that you, you're, you already have contingency planning within your documents. We do appreciate um, you being with us today. We welcome you to go to our website and there is a um, contact button to contact us to request a meeting with one of our financial advisors. We would love to meet with you. And we do thank you for joining today. I hope you all have a great day.